When you are buying a house, it is important to know the difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage banker. If you're an entrepreneur, a day trader, independent contractor, a veteran, or if you have a profession that just does not fit that typical mold that the big banks like to see, then you will definitely want to listen to this episode. Welcome to Florida Keys Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, April Struess, and today we are going to discuss different types of mortgage loans and the process of getting a mortgage loan when buying a home. To help guide us on this process, I am proud to introduce local mortgage broker expert, Claudia Stober with Mortgage Choice. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, April. Thank you so much for joining us. Claudia, tell us about you and Mortgage Choice and about the industry. Well, uh, Mortgage Choice has been my family's business since 1991, and I opened up the branch in Isla Mirada in uh, 2005. So we are celebrating 15 years this year. Now, the industry, as you may recall, has had some ups and downs. And, you know, back in 2007 and 2008, the bottom fell out and everybody, we had a lot of loose money practices and then the lenders tightened up. And I'm happy to report that they are loosening back up again, Um, not to the point where we were back in 2006. Uh, They obviously, they learned their lesson, but it's certainly a lot easier to get a mortgage now than it was back in 2009, 2010. Okay. Well, first, congratulations on the 15 years. That's exciting. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I blinked and it happened. <laughs> I, I I don't know where the time went. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so a common question is mortgage broker, mortgage banker. What's the difference? Pros and cons. No cons, but pros. Uh, what makes it different? Well, the difference is when a buyer goes to a bank for a mortgage, the buyer is limited to the products and the rates that that bank offers. And each bank is different. So what one bank likes, another bank might not. So that person goes, and of course the buyer doesn't know these things because they're not very familiar with these banks. They're just going to the bank because it's the bank on the corner, it's the bank that they have their checking account with. When you go to a mortgage broker, like I have five wholesale lenders that I work with and I have access to their products and their rates. So I essentially have five times the variety, if you will, that a bank then, let's say Bank of America would have. I'm also able, back to the nuances of each bank that I mentioned just uh, not too long ago, I'm able to look at a buyer's credit profile and I can see, okay, this bank is going to have an issue because of X, Y, and Z, but this bank will not. The Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who sets the guidelines for what the minimums are for a loan, for the guidelines, each bank will say, okay, I know this is what you want, but we want to be stricter. Or we'll say, okay, we'll stay with you know the guidelines that you set forth. So I'm able to look at a client's profile and know which bank will have it will have an easier time to get a loan with which bank it might be harder like for example let's say there's someone who is self-employed and last year their taxes were amazing but the year before their taxes weren't so hot some banks require 2 years of self-employed income taxes and they average the 2 years other banks only require the last year as long as you've been in business for longer than five years. I know which banks will allow only one year. So if that buyer goes to, let's say, Bank of America, that will require an average, and that average brings their income down where they won't qualify, they'll get denied for the loan. Whereas I know, okay, this lender will allow only one year, therefore we're just gonna use them, and we need to only go with one year to have the, the loan approved, so then we will just go to the banks that only require one year. If I have a buyer that does not have anything on their credit profile that might be kind of funky for a lender, then I just shop it around to all of the lenders to see who's going to give the best rate. So that's the advantage of going to a mortgage broker versus just the bank, you know, your local bank on the corner, because you're able to have more options, more variety of programs, and ultimately get the better rate. Yeah. And, you know, that's really great because I know I've run into buyers who don't have the typical W-2 form, typical right. job, nine to five, you know, especially with quite a few second home buyers is that they might be day traders or be 
entrepreneurs right. that they have cash wise, they look really great. But on paper, maybe not just because of how they're using their cash. So it sounds like a mortgage Correct. broker would definitely be a better way to approach because like you said, you can kind of find which lender will work for them for their situation. Correct. And I've worked with these lenders. Some of these lenders, I think I've worked, uh, I know one I've definitely worked from since the mm -hmm. beginning. So many times if there's a loan profile that I'm kind of iffy on, I will run it by them and say, listen, this is what we have. I know you guys like two years of overtime income, but we only have a year and a half. Will you work with me on getting this through? And we know this before we get halfway through the process and then find out, oh, we needed two years and you only have a year and a half. So I'm able to discuss that with them. Plus, I tell the buyers from the beginning that I work for them. If you have a buyer that doesn't have what they're starting to do now, uh, lenders are opening up, as I mentioned earlier, and more products. We don't have a stated income product anymore like we used to have where you just said, oh, I make 10000 a month and they would accept it. What lenders have now, and this works for self-employed borrowers, and my lenders do this, but the retail banks might not, they will use your bank statement to calculate your income and to qualify your income. So instead of using your tax returns, so let's say you are in a business where you have a lot of deductions that you run through and your bottom line is a lot lower than it really is, I'm able to use your deposits into your bank statements as qualifying income. That is nice. Now, is that new? It's about two years old and more and more lenders are starting to do it. Like you always have a couple that are the most aggressive will be the first ones to go back out there. But then they wait to see, you know, what happens and how those lenders handle it. And if it seems to work without the sky falling, then other banks jump in. And that's what's starting to happen. Okay. Now. So it sounds like there's lots of options when it comes to the buyer on, if they're not your typical buyer, as in income, W-2 type form, that there's more options than mortgage broker. What about, now what Correct. about uh, different loan opportunities, conventional, FHA, VA, et cetera? Oh, there are so many <laughs> loan programs out there. Okay, so you have conforming or conventional, which will work for primary, a second home, or an investment property. And our, we're very fortunate in the Keys that our conforming loan limit is 552000 So we're higher than the national average because our cost of living here, our median uh, home price is a lot higher. Now, going back to what I was speaking about earlier with the difference of a mortgage broker and a bank on the corner, I actually have a lender in my, I guess, in my inventory, my repertoire of lenders that will let us go up to 765000 before it's considered jump. Wow. That is really good. Right. So going back, not to hit that point again, but if I have a buyer who would only qualify as a conforming loan but they need a loan greater than 552000 then I know that that's going to be the lender we go to because jumbo, so anything higher than 552000 is considered a jumbo right. loan. And a jumbo loan has stricter down payment requirements. And when you close cash reserve requirements, they want to make sure that you have cash in the bank for each property that you own if you're in a jumbo. A jumbo also has higher credit score requirements. Whereas conforming, the minimum credit score on conforming is 620. The minimum credit score on a jumbo is 700. Oh. The minimum down payment on conforming is 5% if it's a primary residence, 10% if it's a second home. For a jumbo, the minimum down payment is 10%. So there are differences uh, between conforming and jumbo. And as I said earlier, you can do primary home, second home, or investment property. And you can do any property as long as it's four units or less. Okay. So after conventional, uh, which are not uh, government loans, now we have the government loans, which are FHA and VA. And they are insured by the government, which means that your interest rate is going to be less because if the borrower defaults on a loan, the lender will, uh, is, it's insured and the lender will not lose their money. With FHA and VA, it has to be primary residence only. Anyone is eligible for an FHA loan, 
the loan limit on an FHA loan is $552,000. And you can use it to buy anything up to a four-unit property. So if you want, as a primary residence, to buy a, let's say, a duplex and live in one side and rent out the other, you can do that with an FHA. The minimum down payment is 3.5%, and they do require mortgage insurance for the life of the loan, which can be a drawback because with conventional, if you put less than 20% down, they do require mortgage insurance. But after the 20%, after you've built up your equity, they remove the mortgage insurance. With FHA, unfortunately, they do not. But depending on a buyer's credit score, because FHA does not hit you, so if you have a lower credit score, it'll be cheaper to go through the FHA program, have a lower rate with the mortgage insurance, and it'll still be cheaper a month, usually, than a conventional loan. FHA also allows for looser guidelines. They'll allow a credit score of 580, And they will also allow your debt to income to go up to 55%, which is higher than conforming. And then we have the VA loan, which is my favorite loan. There's not a loan limit on a VA loan. The government allows each lender to decide what the loan limit's going to be. And as of this year, they removed the minimum down payment. So you do have to be a veteran to apply for a VA loan, but... If you are a veteran, you can purchase a million dollar property without putting any money down. Uh, You do pay a funding fee in the beginning, but you can work that into your loan amount so you don't pay it out of pocket, but then you don't have mortgage insurance each month. It really is the cheapest product out there. You do, however, have to be a veteran um, to do it, but it's it's one of the greatest products and you can get a loan for up to, I mean, I've seen banks go up to one and a half, two million dollars on a VA. That's amazing. And what's really amazing is a couple of things that you just said was one about the talk about jumbo loans and how, what was the number? 700 and 765,000. Right. How Murnau County is that's the, before you reach a jumbo loan, because as, as you know, our houses down here tend to be higher priced. So, higher. Uh, you know, Correct. it's typical, uh, a single family home on dry lot, you know, four to 500,000, you can get hit anywhere Correct. else. You'd hit jumbo loan here. You're still. You're still considered, yes, our limit across the board with the lenders here in Monroe County is 552. But I do have that one lender that does the exception and go up to 765, which is great because what usually gets people for the jumbo is once you close, the lender wants you to have six to 12 months reserves PITI. So whatever your monthly payment is, after you close and the dust is settled, they want you to have either six or 12 months worth of those payments sitting in a bank. Right. And that's a that's a lot of money to think you just shelled out all of this money for a down payment and the closing costs and everything. And now on top of that, you have to have just sitting there, right. you know, 40,000, 50,000. So if we can work around the jumbo and also jumbo rates are higher than conforming. If we can skirt around the jumbo and still take it to 700, you know, plus thousand, it, it really is beneficial. Oh, yeah. No, that's great. Um, Like you said, because that's a big chunk of change to just sitting and not being to invest it in something or using it in another way that could produce more money. Right. And and then, well, we also have non-conforming loans. I mean, we have so many loans out there. (laughs) So that was all the conforming loans. And I'll go quickly, like the non-conforming, which um, I mentioned earlier, uh, let's say the bank statement loans that they use the deposits in the bank statement for um, income qualifications. So that's one of them. Another loan is if the person is retired, they'll do what's called asset depletion. So if a person is retired and is sitting on a nice retirement account, the lenders will say, okay, if we take this retirement account and they hit it by a factor of, let's say, 80%, they then divide it by 360, assuming they were going to deplete the assets. So this works for people who are retired but aren't really drawing on their assets yet. So it's not showing up on their tax returns, but they have the assets that if they theoretically withdrew 360 months for a 30 year mortgage, they would be able to use that for income qualification to purchase this house. And then the third uh, program that they have for an investment properties is where they use the income potential of the rental property as qualification. They don't look at the um, person's income at all, just what the property should produce. 
So we have those, those programs as well, which is on the non-conforming side. And that one's really interesting because especially down here, when we have some of the condos here that you can do five or seven day rentals, you know, most of them are 28 day minimum rentals, but, or vacation homes that people are looking to rent out half the time and then stay half the time. That's a nice product to right. look at. Right. right and it's something, and it goes back to just looking at, you know, the buyer's credit profile and figuring out right. what's going to work best for them. Right. You know, right. both for them financially and for the lender to close on this loan. So you have a buyer, they want to buy a house here in the Keys. Obviously, they need to get pre qual before we even start looking at houses yes. because it's just no sense in looking without no. knowing what can you afford. Right. So what do they need to do? I always recommend before they, when they call me to start looking, like, have you been pre-qualified, pre-approved? Because if not, you need to talk to someone first. So they approach you. What, what do you do? What do you, well, what's your steps? For pre-qualification, if they're salaried, I just need pay stubs just to see what their salary is. I generally don't pull the credit report until we have a contract, an executed contract. I obviously ask them what their um, monthly liabilities are. And if there's anything on their credit, any bankruptcies, foreclosures, anything that we should worry about. And they should have a general idea as to what their credit score is. Okay. Brennan, when I pull the credit score, it's generally lower than if they go to like Credit Karma, because depending on why you're pulling the credit, whether it's just to inquire about your score or whether it is to get a mortgage, your credit, believe it or not, your score is calculated differently. So when you're going, yeah, when you're going, which, which stinks because people will say, oh, well, my score on credit karma is this. Well, when you go on to just inquire about your score, it's calculated in a more lenient way than if you're calculating it for a mortgage. So when I pull it, it's always, a you know, I would say maybe 10, 15 points lower, but Mm -hmm. even, even if they know what it is by credit karma, it's a good baseline in order to be able to establish, okay, what their rate would be. So they should know what their credit is. I would need pay stubs to calculate if they're uh, salary. If they are self-employed, I do need taxes because there's a formula that we use based on the schedules of the taxes to calculate their income. And then I just need to know what they have in the bank. And that's pretty much just all I need for a pre-qualification. Once they have the contract, that's when I'll pull the credit and all that. And I generally don't like pulling credit because it might, a credit report's only good for three months. And it Mm -hmm. might take someone that long to find a property. I mean, we don't have that much inventory down here. And sometimes people are waiting and it takes longer. And I don't want to pull the credit twice if I don't have to. And not necessarily that it damages the credit, but every time I pull the credit, it costs $70. And I know it sounds silly, but why spend the money or have the hit on your credit report if you don't need it? Now, if someone tells me, oh, you know, I didn't, I have these collections or this, I'm not quite sure. Then I will pull the credit ahead of time. If they're, you know, if they say, oh, I think my score might be 620, you know, yes, then I will pull the credit score ahead of time. But if someone says that they pay their bills on time and this is what they have on the report, then I just wait. Yeah, so it sounds like obviously a case-by-case correct situation on the buyer. So I agree with you about the process of not pulling it because like I've had buyers that I've worked with six to nine months, right. that just can't find their dream house. And a lot of times down here, as you know, it's, you know, we have a huge second home buyers, sellers right. here. And so they don't need that house right now. So they're wait, if they right. need to wait six months, they don't care. So I, I see what you're saying about not pulling the credit because it could definitely take longer than three right. months easily. Right. And I also don't like to get I I try to be conscientious of the work that the buyer has to do as well. And so, you know, like bank statements, you know, if they want to just, I usually just ask for the first page of the bank statement. Eventually I will need the whole bank statement, but I don't want them to get all of it because bank statements also are only good for three months. So if they're getting all of this documentation to me and let's say three months from now, we still haven't closed. I need all the documentation again. And so I try to make it as painless as possible for the buyer and and knowing that sometimes lenders do ask for a lot of documentation. So that's why in the beginning, I just ask for the bare minimum that I need to in order to confidently send out a pre-qualification lender, a letter. And then once, once it's under contract, then obviously, you know, I'll get the rest of the documentation. Yeah. Dig a little deeper. Right. So we found a house, we have a ratified contract. Uh, moving forward, 
how long, I know we usually do 30 to 45 days for closing just for a safety net, but what's kind of your time frame? I'm, I'm assuming obviously it depends on the lender, but what's kind right. of time frame to close, process, et cetera? Each lender, you know, it depends on the person. I have, I just closed a loan that the buyer was, it was her first time buying a home. She obviously didn't have any other house. She was salaried and her bank statements were clean. In other words, there wasn't a lot of deposit documentation I needed to do from beginning to end. And this, which was actually really impressive that the bank even got it done because it was during the holidays. Beginning to end was three weeks. Oh, that's great. Yes. And then I have, I have lenders that are super fast. So if you have a buyer, you know, again, the, the advantage of a mortgage broker, if you have a buyer that has a quick closing timeline, then I know we're limited to these banks that are fast. So I, I have a bank that claims they can close in two weeks. Um, I have yet to close a loan with them in two weeks, but I also haven't had to close a loan with them in two weeks. I would say roughly if, you know, if you're self-employed and you have a more complex credit profile, you're looking at closer to a month. Uh, but I would say it's safe to say between three and four weeks. Okay. And then the process for actual underwriting, you know, once I have all the information and I submit it to the lender, it'll take anywhere between two and four days for them to underwrite it. And then they come back with um, an approval with conditions. And then the buyer and I work on clearing the conditions. And the conditions are generally appraisal, title, insurance, or they want to see that the earnest money deposit has cleared the bank, you know, and, and it might be something specific to that credit. Like if they have other properties that the buyer owns, then they're going to want to see the mortgage statements or evidence that those properties are held free and clear. Usually I try to get all of this information and documentation before we submit it because I want to have as clean of a condition log as possible when it comes out of underwriting. So this is kind of nice because you are kind of working with you. They have the benefits of choosing lots of lenders, but also a local expert. Because I know a lot of times when I've dealt with buyers who have lenders who are not local, it can be a little shady sometimes because they might not be familiar with all of our craziness down here with our insurance process with, you know, just flood insurance, wind insurance, just, and you know, if it's a condo association, just all the different rules we have down here. But with you, it's nice because then you can pick out different lenders who aren't local, but then you're like a local expert who can help the underwriters if they have any questions. Correct. And, and what we actually, what I noticed that that's really beneficial is a lot of the homes down here have downstairs enclosures. Yes. And so, you know, I, I know how to work around that with the lenders and I haven't, I mean, knock on wood, I haven't had a downstairs enclosure screw up a deal in quite some time. So for those who don't know what a downstairs enclosure, like what are you talking about when, because that's huge down here, but kind of explain why that would affect lending at all. The reason why that is a problem with the lender is usually the seller or at some point, an owner of that home has enclosed the downstairs because our homes are on stilts, has enclosed that downstairs and has made it a separate living quarter that they rent out for additional income. But the house is not deemed as a two unit property. It's legally zoned as a single family residence. So for the lender, they have a problem with it because they're seeing as a house with two kitchens, two living spaces. Now, a home can have a mother-in-law's quarters. There's nothing against that. A home can have a main kitchen and a summer kitchen. There's nothing against that. So that's where uh, my expertise would come in that I know, I know which lenders don't have problems with the downstairs enclosures. And I know which ones will give me or won't be willing to be as bending on that exception as others. So that's where the local knowledge comes in, because if you go to, let's say, someone in Quicken who's sitting in a room in the middle of the United States, they don't understand the nuances or the characteristics, I should say, of the homes in our market. One of them being the downstairs enclosure. Another one also is a home that's below flood. Some lenders have issues if it's below flood. Some lenders do not. And so that's where the local knowledge will know, will come in handy, whereas someone, you know, at Quicken wouldn't know that. Yeah, those are those are great points that you brought up. You're exactly right. There's so many homes here who, since we're on stilts, people want to use that downstairs right. area they have because it's great living area. Um, so yeah, they might add a kitchen for their 
in-laws to stay in or to rent it out or whatever. And so, like you said, because I've seen appraisals come in and then, you know, the appraiser will come and like, wait, there's two kitchens. So like you said, if it's a lender who's not familiar with our market, that could stop the deal. Correct. Um, Same thing when they see an elevation certificate that the downstairs is below flood. Again, that could stop a deal. So it's really important having a local expert who knows our kind of quirkiness here uh, to get the process done. Right. And well, and it's also really beneficial with condos because, condos. you know, condos, condos, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, condos, condos are different because not only does the buyer need to get approved that they can qualify for the mortgage, but the condo association needs to be approved in the sense that they are financially sound. And so lenders like it when condos have reserves And a lot of the condos here don't have reserves. And it's not that that's a reflection on whether they are financially sound or not. It's just the owners of the condos, you know, the HOA decided that instead of being nickeled and dimed every month, they would rather have assessments. And that's fine. That's the prerogative to do that. So I know which condos can go through a full review, meaning that their budget and their insurance and their questionnaire is reviewed and which ones we have to go through a limited review. A limited review has different guidelines and a limited review just means that you don't need to show their budget and you have a limited questionnaire. You do need to show their insurance, but some of the sticking points get to fly under the radar with a limited review. And you can tell me a condo project and I'll tell you which way we have to go. Whereas any person who's not a local lender would not know that. And what would probably happen is they would go full force until they get to the condo approval portion of underwriting. And then the loan will crash and burn because the condo, which should have gone as a limited review, is going through as a full review and can't pass their guidelines. Yeah. And you're correct because condos, townhomes here is a whole nother animal for us here. So again, having that local expert knowing exactly, because I've seen it too, when I've, I've had a listing and a, a buyer comes and they have an outside lender mm-hmm. and they put an offer, it kind of worries me sometimes. I'm like, oh, I hope this works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do they really understand all of our, every condo here? So having someone who knows all the condos is a big help. Well, right. And unless you have closed a unit in that condo, you don't know. Because Why you, would certainly, you? you right. certainly can't tell by looking the outside of them. No. Mm-mm. You only no. know unless you've seen the budget. And, I, and, right. and when we are working with a condo that I haven't closed on or I haven't closed on in a while because things can change, of HOAs course. can vote to no longer have reserves. I always ask to see the budget first uh, so I know if we're going to have any problems. Right. Not necessarily problems. So I know which way to take this, whether a full review right. or a limited review. Right. You know what to expect. Exactly. So going on to another type of home we have a lot of here is mobile homes. What's your lending policy your lenders do with mobile homes? Because I know that's always a question of, will I be able to finance it? Is there going to be any issues, et cetera, with mobile homes? And we have quite a few of those here. Mobile homes, they have to be newer than June 30th, 1976. So as long as they're newer than June 30th, 1976, we're good. Some lenders require it to be double wide. Right. Some lenders allow single wide. If we're going to go single wide, it's generally only through the FHA or VA program that will allow single wide. So it would have to be a primary residence. If it's a second home, then it has to be double wide. And that's for conforming. I have portfolio lenders when we're going through all the lenders. I also have portfolio lenders that do special things like mobile home of any size, any age. Going back to condos, I have lenders that will do condo tells, but those are portfolio lenders and they just specialize in that kind of product. Okay. The construction loans. I have access to construction loans as well, but they are specific to that bank. And because they're specific to that bank, that bank gets to call the shots on what their down payment requirements are. Okay. And that's funny. I was just about to ask you about construction loans, vacant land. How does that all work for you? Say they have a vacant land and they're going to build on it. You have lenders who can provide construction loans. Right. Well, if you're going to buy a vacant land and build on it, you want to make sure, because our permitting process takes longer than the average, you want to Mm -hmm. make sure that the permits are ready to go. 
because a construction loan is only good for 12, 18, or 24 months. So you don't want to get one that is going to take you three years to go through permitting because the loan will have expired before you even get your permit. Good to know. Yeah. If you have a lot that you want to purchase that it looks like it's going to take longer to get permitting, then what I would suggest would be just to purchase it with a lot loan. And then when you do have your permits ready to go, you can refinance that lot loan into a construction loan. Yes, it's two closings versus one, but it's certainly going to be cheaper than paying money on a construction loan that you're not really doing any construction on because you're waiting for your permits to come through the system. Exactly. And especially like you said, our permit process tend to take a little longer than other parts of the country. Right. We have the ROGO, so they only issue a certain number of permits a year. Exactly, which is a whole other topic. <laughs> right. right. But uh, I mean, construction loans are neat. The way it works is you pay while you're under construction. You'll have draws. They'll have draws set up and you only pay on what you have drawn out and you pay only interest only. So Each time you have a draw, your monthly payment is going to go up because you have taken more money out. Then when it's all said and done and your CO, your certificate of occupancy is issued, then whatever you have taken out converts into a fixed rate, fully amortized loan for 30 years. Oh, so you don't have to refire. You don't have to reclose. Oh, awesome. No. That's great. Very nice. So kind of switching subjects, but similar. Say you have a buyer who buys a vacant land or a house or whatever but they want to put it in LLC. I get that question a lot of, you know, for the liability purpose, they don't want to put it under their name, the LLC. How do you approach that? Can they get a loan under LLC or how does that work? They can. And that goes back to the portfolio lenders. LLC, before the 2008 debacle, uh, you could do a conforming loan in an LLC. That was not a problem. And I guess banks figured out when everything went south that it was hard to go after the LLCs. So they stopped doing that. But I do have portfolio lenders that will allow LLC in both primary, second, or an investment property. And it's the same underwriting. The borrower, the person who is the managing member of the LLC is the one who has to qualify. But title will be held. I'm actually... I'm doing one right now. Title will be held in LLC. And the the only difference is the person has to sign two sets of documents. One as an individual and one as an LLC. Oh, okay. That's it. So good. It's good that's available. So, and then also kind of with similar question is, again, we have lots of secondary homes here. Is the lending process different for if it's a primary nope. or a secondary home? The only same? difference is interest rates exactly the same. Oh, great. Uh, there aren't any reserve requirements, not like an invest, uh, investment You know, some investment uh, loan products will have reserve requirements. Second home does not. The only difference is for a primary residence, your minimum down payment is 5%. For a second home, your minimum down payment is 10%. That is the only difference between a primary and a second home. Okay, that's not bad. No. Not bad at all. No, underwriting is exactly the same amount of time for the loan process, exactly the same. Interest rate, exactly the same. Great. And credit score, exactly the same. Oh, good. That is really good. Yeah, Yeah, not bad at all. Mm -mm. So, Claudia, I want to thank you so much for answering all these questions. You have been wonderful to work with in the past and in the future. Looking forward to doing more deals with you. And if a buyer has any more questions for you about the mortgage lending process, any questions about looking at a property down here, how can I get in touch with you? Well, they can certainly call me. My office is uh, 305-664-4664. And if I'm not in my office, it will ring to my cell phone. And then you can always email me at uh, RC Stober. That's S as in Sam, T as in Tom, O as in Oscar, B as in boy, E as in Edward, R as in Robert at bellsouth.net. Perfect. Well, once again, Claudia, I really appreciate you coming and answering all these questions for me. It's been very informative. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, April. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to my show, the Florida Keys Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, April Struess. If you have any real estate questions regarding the Florida Keys, please feel free to reach out to me through my website at www.floridakeyssearch.com or you can give me a call at 305-399-6297. Have a wonderful day.